Um, uh, I am unable to record the session. Okay, wait, there we go. You're recording. Make sure everyone knows you're being recorded. Okay. So, all right. Session is being recorded. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we said interstate laws when you die without a valid will. So now we do not have a will to guide us in terms of who must inherit. So the question is then posed when the scenario is brought forward, you will need to determine who is next in line to benefit and inherit. This is a practical scenario, ladies and gentlemen. Hence, some notes were sent through. It's just some hand drafted notes I did myself where I set out some rules that we can follow. Should we follow these rules, we cannot go wrong. It is one, two, three, four, five, six pages that was sent through, and hopefully you all have opened it up, alternatively printed it out, because I want to go through these pages with you. Um, when we're done with each different scenario, I will obviously allow for any questions for those who don't quite follow. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, before we start looking, if we can just go to page two. Page two, you will see I, I sort of just drafted a family tree over there. So I think what's important is let's understand this family tree before we start looking at the different scenarios. So, ladies and gentlemen, when I pose a scenario to you and I say this person passes away intestate, uh, so there's no will or no valid will, and the estate value is X amount. Uh, and sorry. then I say who that person leaves behind. So that say person page, may... Page. page two. Please make sure you're muted as well, ladies and gents. Yes, but uh, I need to get myself in order because page two doesn't indicate that on my side. What is page two? Yeah, uh, it's still syllabus. Uh, are, you, are you referring to the notes that was emailed through to you? Uh, um, yeah, no, these ones were physically collected. Wills no, 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 I'm referring to, to notes that Zukiswa emailed through to all the students. Not all right, I'll have to deal with that myself. Let me not disrupt. Okay, uh, just, just have a look at your email communication as well. Uh, I think it's Raymond. It's um, Raymond, yes. Yeah. Yeah, just have a look there because there's some notes that was emailed through. I'm not sure if it was done yesterday or earlier this morning, but Sequisa did confirm with me that she sent it through to everyone. Thank you, sir. Um, sorry to disturb. Um, I think um, he's most likely not to find them in his email because I didn't receive the email, but it is available on the website on eLearner, so he can find them there. Okay, fantastic. Do you know what it's what it's what is under? It under the notification tab, so he should be able to find it there. Okay, did you, did you catch that, Raymond? All right, so so right. everyone... I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sort myself up. All right, so just everyone just uh, look under the eLeader website under notifications. Perhaps I, I think it's in everyone's interest um, for those who, who didn't have it when we started, because I think it's important for tonight's lecture. Perhaps I'll just give it another minute or two, ladies and gents, for those who do not have it to go to the eLeader website and go get it under notifications. So let's pause for a minute and uh, uh, then we'll pick up from there. Hi, Kyle. Uh, just to make it easy, can someone just share it on, on the chat so that even those people that can't get to the to, to, to the eLeader or, 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 or their emails that they can access it on their phones? Perfect. If, if someone can uh, attend to that as well, that would make life even more easier. Please. Does anyone perhaps have an idea how to share the document? 
Um, the documents. Yes, upward arrow there. Upward arrow next to the red one. Pardon? Just next to the leaf, the, the big icon leaf, you will see a, an arrow facing upward. Just press on it. I think the share thing is disabled. Yes. Unless you are like a presenter or organizer. Yeah. Because it's not right. That I've shared the documents. Please check yeah. the meeting chat. It is being shared currently by someone in the chat. Yeah, it's in the chat, guys. Hello, baby. I'm done. Fine, how are you? Yeah, I, I also... We can hear conversations. Please mute. Yeah, I, I also sent it on the, uh, tele, the Telegram groups now. I shared okay. it on the um, chat right now, so you should see it. Yeah. I think it's a Mr. Stephen. Uh, we can hear your conversation. Oh, sorry. All right. I, I, no stress. No stress. I see it's been shared, ladies and gentlemen, on, on the chat group. And I also heard someone mention it's on Telegram. So at this stage, we didn't have it already in front of you. I'm sure you are able to find it now. All right, and I see on the group as well, there's the link to the WhatsApp group chat. So it's on the WhatsApp group chat, the Telegram group, as well is on the chats to this uh, Teams meeting. So everyone should be in possession of it. Now, uh, as mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, this is, um, this is documents that I drafted myself that I sent through and I thought it will make life easier for us when talking about interstate law. And I think I'll mention it now already. When we deal with the L&D tomorrow and Thursday, have a look out tomorrow afternoon. You will be receiving further notes from myself regarding the L&D account as well. So I mentioned that now so that when we come together at half past five tomorrow, everyone knows where to find the L&D uh, notes. And please, if you got it, share it on the group before we start at 5.30 as well on the Telegram groups and so forth so that uh, we kick things off straight away. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, if the documents were put forward in the order I gave it, it's about six pages. And uh, I'm referring to the page where I just drew a diagram. It should be page two. Now, if we have a look at that diagram, you will see... In the middle, I have a deceased person. Next to the deceased person, you always put that deceased person surviving spouse, right? Whenever faced with an interstate question, the, the ideal thing to do is to first draw out this person's family tree. Because a question will say the person leaves behind a spouse and children or a mother and a father or brothers and sisters or half brothers or half sisters. Always draw out the scenario in a family tree before you answer it. It makes life easier. So all I'm displaying on this uh, page two here is simply how you would go about drawing out an interstate question. You would draw the deceased person. Right next to the deceased person, you would draw the spouse. So I just wrote their spouse. Now, if I say the deceased person has children, the children will come underneath the deceased person. If I say the children of your children, which is obviously the deceased grandchildren, they then come underneath the children. So you'll see their child and grandchildren. Everyone going down, we refer to as descendants. All right. So spouse and children are drafted there, and the children are descendants. Then if you have a look above the deceased, you'll see mother and father of the deceased person. They are ascendants, so they go upwards. And then in the same row as the deceased, you see brothers and sisters. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if I told you a half-brother or a half-sister or a full brother and a full sister, they, they all go next to the deceased. So they are on the same level of the deceased. People on the same level of the deceased are called collaterals. Okay. You'll see in my notes I said they're collaterals except for spouse. The spouse is also drawn on the same wavelength as the brothers and sisters. However, they exclude it. The spouse is just always put next to the deceased person. 
Now, I explained to you in the specific order where I said spouse and children, and then I said secondly, parents upwards, and thirdly, collaterals, brothers and sisters. And the reason why I explained it to you in this order is because that is the way people inherit in that specific order. If there is a spouse and children, the spouse and children will just inherit. If there's just a spouse, the spouse will take everything. If there's just children, the children will take everything. If there's a spouse and children, they will share in the inheritance. It is only if there is no spouse and children that we consider the second step, which is your mother and father, your ascendants. If there is no mother and father alive at the time you die, then we move on to the third step, which is your collaterals, brothers and sisters. So all I've done here is illustrate how we would draft our family tree. Okay. We can now refer to page one. It has the heading intestate, if it's in the same order as mine. Yeah, you will see I wrote down some rules to follow when dealing with intestate law. If we stick to these rules, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot go wrong come exam time. All right. This is not one of those things where uh, depending on the different scenario I present to you, you might have to use your discretion or interpret things differently. The moment you start interpreting things with interstate law or applying your discretion, I can tell you what you're going wrong and you're going to get the answer wrong. Stick to these rules, apply these rules strictly. So let's have a look. On the top of the page by interstate, I wrote there, always sort marriage out before applying the laws of interstate. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a golden rule to remember. This is not just for intestate law, but this is for testate law as well. When someone is married in community of property, the surviving spouse is entitled to half of their estate. Okay. The fact that they are entitled to half of the estate has nothing to do with the will or nothing to do with intestate law as you are dealing with um, this evening. Right. So the first thing you would do if I presented a scenario and saying a person died with a million rand and left a surviving spouse and they were married in community of property, the very first thing you would do is give half of that to the surviving spouse. And then you would start worrying about intestate law. These are five rules that are jotted down on the page. If they were married out of community of property, then fine, we don't have to give something to our spouse. But always look at marriage first, sort the marriage out, who's entitled to what because of the marriage, and when you're done with marriage, then you worry about intestate law. So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay. Then you'll see I wrote there laws slash rules. And I gave you five different rules to follow. This is the order in which people inherit. I think let us look at rule one. And then we'll look at page three and four where I gave different examples of how to interpret rule one. After we've been through that. I'll then open the floor up for any questions for those that are struggling with rule one. So from the five rules, I believe rule one and rule three is your most complex rules. Rule two, four and five uh, is quite easy and sort of speaks for itself. So I think before we look at these five rules, you'll see at the bottom of the page I wrote their tip and I put two arrows. I just want to speak about those tips. The first one is only can inherit through blood. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a golden rule. When it comes to intestate law and you've got to determine who's next in line to inherit if there was no will, make sure there's blood relation. The only exception to the rule is your spouse. You and your spouse are not blood related. However, they inherit. But everyone else can only inherit through blood relation. If you are giving something to uh, to someone and they are not blood related to the deceased person, then you must know straight away you are making a mistake. All right. The second tip: remember the rules regarding renouncing and pre-deceased and adoption. So, an easy way, if you recall from last night, we spoke about Section Two C of the Wills Act, and we said that if someone renounces their inheritance. The inheritance goes to the surviving spouse. And we said if someone is predeceased or disqualified, the inheritance goes to their descendants per stirps. Ladies and gentlemen, those rules of Section 2C, they apply to intestate law as well. Okay, 
keep that in mind. 2C from the test state law from last night is also applicable to intestate state law. And then I mentioned there and adoption. Same rules. If I told you that the deceased person died in test state and they had an adopted child, keep in mind that adopted child is treated in the same way as if it was their biological child. Okay. So before us even looking at the rules, we've kept in mind sort marriage out first. Once marriage is sorted, we look at intestate law. Keep in mind section 2C applies. Remember the adoption law. And then also keep in mind that you can only inherit if you are blood related, except of course if you are the spouse of the deceased person. All right. So let's use that as our opening intro. And then let's look at our very first rule regarding intestate law. Number one, I've said that spouse and children inherit first. Spouse must receive the greater of 250,000 Rand or an equal share. Okay. So straight away by reading that, we know if we had a family tree that had deceased persons, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, cousins, uncles, aunties, and spouse, and the deceased person's spouse and children involved, everyone becomes irrelevant besides the spouse and children. If there's children or a spouse or spouse and children that the deceased person leaves behind, they will only inherit, nobody else. But it goes further to say the spouse must receive the greater of 250,000 or an equal share. So let us say, for example, just to make practical sense of this, let's say the deceased person died intestate and they say, let's say uh, they had an estate value of 900,000 Rand and they left behind a spouse and they left behind two children. Okay. And let's say the, the deceased and the spouse is married out of community of property. So marriage wasn't really applicable. I would take that 900,000 Rand and I would divide it between the spouse and the two kids. So it's divided by three, in other words. That would equate to 300,000 Rand for each of the two children as well as the spouse. Now I look at my rule. The spouse received the greater of 250,000 or an equal share. 300,000 Rand was an equal share. 300,000 Rand was greater than 250,000 Rand. So no problem whatsoever. I gave them each 300,000 Rand. I'm compliant with the law. But if I had to take that exact same scenario I just gave you now and change that marriage to one of in community of property, then I would have to take that 900,000 Rand and give half to the surviving spouse. So that's 450,000 Rand I'm giving away because of the marriage. Meaning there's 450,000 Rand left. Now I start my intestate law. 450,000 Rand divided by the spouse and two children is 150,000 Rand each. But now, you know, red light should be flashing. We should be, re we should be realizing that 150,000 Rand each is less than 250,000 Rand. But the rule does not want the spouse to get less than 250,000 Rand. So I cannot give the spouse and each child 150,000 Rand because the rule says the spouse must get the greater of equal share or 250. So I have to go and give the spouse 250,000 Rand. There is thus 100, oh, sorry, there is then 200,000 Rand left. Each child will then take 100,000. Okay. So when you divide the money between the spouse and children, see how much it is. If that equal share between them is more than 250,000 Rand, no problem. Give it to them. If it is less than 250,000 Rand, you will have to give the spouse 250. What's left, divide amongst the children. So let's have a look at the examples we've put down here. If you turn to page three for me, you'll see the heading says examples. Now, now let's go through this one together. It says here, X dies intestate as an estate value of 800,000 Rand. X leaves behind the following people. His wife Y, to whom he was married in community of property. His daughter A, his adopted daughter B. We see the term adopted daughter B, but it doesn't phase us. It doesn't matter that the daughter's adopted, it's still regarded as X's daughter. His son C, and his mother D. So first thing we do is draw out our family tree. So we have X there, you'll see there's a line through X. Now the question said he leaves behind his wife Y. So you'll see Y is put next to X. 
His daughter A is underneath X. His adopted daughter B is underneath X. His son C is underneath X. And his mother D is above X. But first thing first I see here is there's a spouse and children. So the fact that he left behind a mother or a father or brothers becomes irrelevant. They will not inherit. Because rule one says spouse and children inherit first. Okay. So we've drafted our diagram. We have an estate value of 800,000 Rand. So we learned now, now, the first thing we do is sort marriage out. We see that X is married to Y in community of property. So Y is entitled to half of that 800,000 Rand. You'll see that Y obtains 400,000 Rand because of the marriage in community of property, in COP. Marriage done and dusted. Now that I'm done with the marriage, I move over to intestate law. I have given half to Y because of the marriage, meaning there's only half left. So there's 400,000 Rand left. 400,000 Rand must then be divided to between Y, A, B, and C. It's between four people, right? Because we have a spouse and we have three children. So four people need to share in that according to rule one. So if I take 400,000 Rand and I divide it amongst the four of them, it equals 100,000 Rand each. Now, straight away, we know that's a problem because the rule says Y should get the greater of 250 or an equal share. So you can see there underneath the marriage, I said Y equals 250,000 Rand. And I said that because of the 250,000 Rand rule, Y must get the greater of 250 or an equal share. Unfortunately, the equal share was less than 250. So we had to give the 250 to Y. Meaning there's 150,000 Rand left now. That 150,000 Rand is divided between A, B, and C because of the laws of interstate succession. As you can see, A, B, and C each took 50,000 Rand. Let's try it again. Go to the next page. There is another question that also deals with rule one. So if we can all flip to the next page. Let's go through this one together. It says X dies interstate. A state value of one and a half million. X leaves behind the following people. His wife, Y, to whom he was married out of community of property. So now we know, okay, the marriage is not going to play a role. He leaves behind his brother, A, his son, B, his two granddaughters, C and D, from his predeceased pre daughter, E. So if we had to draw that family tree, you'll see that we drew X, put a line through X. Spouse Y, we put next to X. His brother A, you see A is on the same wavelength because A is a collateral. His son B, B is drawn underneath X. His two granddaughters C and D from his predeceased daughter E. So you'll see we then drew E and put a line through E because E is predeceased. C and D came underneath E, because they are the children of E, right? The deceased grandchildren, in other words. Okay, so how do we deal with this question? We have one and a half million. First of all, let's worry about marriage. Okay, we know they were married out of community or property, so marriage plays no factor, meaning we can jump straight away into the rules of intestate succession. So we now need to count how many people are here. A falls away. A is a collateral. We are only interested in the spouse and children. So we have a spouse Y, we have a son B, that's our second person, and we have a daughter E. E is predeceased, but she's there. One, two, three people over here. Obviously, E can't inherit, but what did Section 2C say we learned yesterday? If you are predeceased, then your children will step into your shoes. In other words, C and D will step into E's shoes. All right. So we have Y, B, and E, and we have 1.5 million. If I had to just divide one and a half million between Y, B, and E, it will equate to 500,000 Rand each. Now the question is, is 500,000 Rand greater than 250,000 Rand? Indeed it is. So we know we have no problem now. So as you can see, we then gave Y 500,000 Rand because the equal share was greater than 250,000. We then went and gave B. B is 500,000 Rand. Now, E must get 500,000 Rand, but E is predeceased. So C and D step into E's shoes to inherit that 500,000 Rand. So we divide E's 500,000 Rand between C and D. 
as you can see there we gave C and D 250,000 rand each because they shared in E's inheritance. Ladies and gentlemen, that is how rule one works. So let me just open the floor. Do we have any questions on rule one? Something we're not understanding. Yes, kind. Go for it. I just wanted to to to, uh, to, to make sure that I'm that I'm following in terms of um, uh, that rule one. It basically means that not if 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 y uh, is out of commit of property, what will then happen is that he gets a 250k or more. Is, am I correct? In this instance, that, um, because it's, uh, it's, yeah. So, so look, the fact that they were married in or out of community of property has nothing to do with the rules. So you just sort the marriage out. If it's in community of property, we gave half away. If it's out, we don't give anything away. And then we go to rule one, okay. which is, you know, so so don't change the rules because of a marriage regime, if, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, it makes okay. sense. All right. <clears throat> Hi, Kyle. Percy here. Hi. Um, just a question of clarity. If uh, what is due to the surviving spouse is less than 250. For argument's sake, uh, the estate is 300,000. And uh, they were married in community of property. So 150, yes, uh, half of the estate, then the, the balance is 150. So each will get 50,000. Maybe it's a spouse and the two kids. Okay. All right, yeah. I hear you. Yeah. All right. But, but, okay, but now remember, apply the rules strictly. So we gave half to the spouse because of the marriage. So there's 150 left in your scenario. If I go 150 divided by the spouse and two kids, it's 50,000 rand each, as you said. Mm -hmm. But the spouse must receive the greater of an equal share of 250. Unfortunately, yes. there is not 250,000 rand to give away. There's only 150 left. So the spouse will then take the whole 150,000 rand. Okay, I understand now. So the kids are not yeah. going to get anything. Correct. You, you see, they don't want the spouse to take less than 250, hey? And uh, unfortunately, if that amount is not there, the spouse will just take everything. It's sort of like a, a protection they put in for the surviving spouse. Um, can I please ask? Yes, proceed. Yes, um, I just when there is two wives and the state is less than 250, how do you work with that? Okay, so that was customary marriage, the same principles apply. Um, so that is, just take someone that's just mute, I'm not sure who, but uh, if we can just mute. Uh, there we go, excellent, okay. So if there was more than one wife, we'd still apply the same principle, just remember, that you can't get married in community of property to more than one person. But let us say there was two wives and, you know, four children. The same rule would apply. That would be the six people involved. You would divide the estate between the six of them, see what an equal share is. If the equal share is less than 250, we'll go and give 250 to each wife. Um, if there's only 250,000 there, then those two wives would share in it. So the fact that we add more wives doesn't change the way we interpret the rules. The spouses, doesn't matter if you're the second, third or fourth spouse, you must, the same rule of 250,000 applies to you as well. Hi, Lair. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, probably someone has already asked the question. Let's say um, X left 300,000 rand and left two children and wife, one wife, I, I mean wife, what will happen because it will be less less than 250, what will happen to other other children? Well, well, those children obtain nothing then because the spouse mustn't get less than 250. So if there's only, let's say, 100,000 rand left, the spouse okay. will take the whole 100,000 rand, the children will get nothing. So the idea behind the rule is the, the spouse must obtain a minimum of 250,000 rand or an equal share if the equal share is higher than 250. Okay, thank so if you, there's sir. just not enough money left involved, the spouse would take everything. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. This Fine, yeah. mm -hmm. Kyle. <laughs> so I heard a I heard a lady speak. 
So we'll do a yes. lady and then I heard another gentleman. So we'll do the lady and then the gentleman. Yes. Okay. Can you please just explain, clarify the 800,000? Because I heard you say she first gets half of the 400, of the 800,000, which is 400,000. And then when she has to share with the children, doesn't she get equal share, like child's share with the children? No. All right. So, so that was in our first example. Yes. So we I gave know. Y half because of the marriage, eh? Yes. Because it was in community of property. So now the, the marriage is sorted. So now we look at interstate rules. Now there's 400,000 rand left. So interstate rule number one says, divide the money between the spouse and children, but the spouse must receive the greater of an equal share or 250,000 rand. So we do, when we divided 400,000 rand amongst the spouse and the three kids, we came to 100,000 rand each. But the problem there is 100,000 rand each is less than 250. So we had to go give the spouse then 250,000 rand. And what was left, we divided between the three kids. So the spouse must always get the greater of an equal share or 250,000 rand. Oh, so she, first she gets half by virtue of her marriage. And then now, then we apply the rules after we pass the marriage. Issue. Correct. Oh, Correct. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah. The marriage is a total separate issue from the five uh, rules that we've set out. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, Kyle. I just, uh, can I just ask... Uh, so in terms of uh, the, the two wives, say two wives, which is the marriage rule that you apply? Sorry, ma'am, I cannot hear a word. Uh, okay, that's better. Hello, Kyle. Hello. Mulifi here. Can you hear me? P proceed. Mulifi? Yes. Yes. If a person gets married customarily, does that mean that person is married in community of property? And if that person is married in community of property, having entered into a customary marriage, what happens when that person takes the second wife? Is it automatic that the second wife is married out of community of property? Please explain. Correct. The Correct. So, so, so I, I can tell you how it works in the absence of, of well, like I said yesterday, what should happen is where if you take a second wife, you should go and record at home affairs what you leave for the second wife or what assets is for the second wife. That's the correct way to do it, which basically means we cancel out this whole discussion and home affairs then has all the documentation over who's entitled to what. But, uh, you know, obviously sometimes people don't go and register things at home affairs. So then the, the law that gets pulled back on is that your first marriage will be in community of property because there is no anti-nuptial contract, which makes it automatically in community of property. But you cannot have more than one marriage in community of property, meaning the second spouse would then become out of community of property. Hello? Okay, thanks. Hi, Perfect. All right, next. Uh, I'm Hi, Kyle. Okay. Hi, Kyle. Okay. How are you? Sorry, I, uh, I'm good and you, ma'am, but there was just someone before you. If you can just go after, after this person, I'll take your question. Yeah, it was no me. No problem. All right, yeah, thank you. It. So I just want to clarify on this. Um, there's a note here that you've made about um, always sort marriage out before applying the laws of the state. So this is only mm. now, we look at this, when in, in circumstances of if these people are married um, in community or property. But then I, I heard you say that um, regardless of whether in community of property or out of community of property, oh no, sorry, out of community of property, regardless, the child that the wife must um, receive greater than 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 um, than the kids, regardless of whatever amount. Let's say, okay, what's left is a hundred thousand rands. So instead of all of them um, receiving equal shares, the, the the wife and the children she will receive everything. She will receive the whole amount. Correct. Because the wife was supposed to receive at least 250, but there was only 100 left. So she has a shortfall actually of 150. So she'll just take what's, so what's left. I think it is not just for um, in, in community of property. It also applies out of community of property. Because Correct. out of These community rules. of property, she would get half of his estate. And then still, she'll receive half of the estate as well as the two hundred and fifty thousand or the greater. If they were, but in if they were in, in, in if they were in, 
yeah, if they were in community of property, but if they're out of community of property, she has to receive the greater of 250 and not half an of his share. estate. Or an equal share, not half of his estate. There we go. Okay, got it. Got it. Hello. Hi, hi. Yes, the person who said hi, Carl, I uh, believe you, you were next. Okay, that's me. Hi, Kai, I'm Karabo. Um, yes, I, I, I wanted clarification on the very same example that you gave us, Ne. Let's say, for instance, that the woman, when the, when the, when the husband died, was pregnant with the, with the third child. I see here the, um, uh, let, let's say here there are two kids, Ne. But the woman is pregnant with the third child. And the woman, they are married in community of property. You take, you first take the half and you give it to the woman. And then the, the other 400,000, 400, you take 250, you give it to the wife because he, she has to get more than 250 or an equal share. What's going to happen to the child that the, the, the wife is carrying? Okay, so, so should that child be born alive? That's the term yes. they use. Then that yes. child will also need to be included in the um, in the calculations. Okay, so the will will be suspended until the child is born and born alive. Correct, and then that inheritance will then be placed in a trust for that child until the child turns 18. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Hi, Kyle. Kyle. Hi, yeah. Um, um, if I may suggest that my colleagues, they're not raising up their hands. We are over 200 in the meeting and then it's going to be a problem for you if you will be answering questions when colleagues are not raising up their hands. But uh, let me go to my point and then Hopefully, you will encourage them to raise their hands up so that we can follow up in the sequence. I can see Desiree was number one. I was number two. Kitty Millen was number three. We had Gina number four. Raymond, let me just stop you there. Uh, Raymond, that's not the way we're doing things. The, the rule is that when I open the floor for questions, what you're supposed to actually do and what people are, are not doing this is supposed to mention your name. So if your name's Raymond, for example, you say Raymond, and I hear your name, and someone says Tandy, for example, I hear Tandy. Yeah. And I take Raymond's question, and then I take Tandy's question. There's just too many hands to deal with, and unfortunately, from the platform I'm using, I cannot see all the hands that are being raised. So that is the oh. issue with it. Yeah. Okay. You no. can proceed, Raymond. Thank you very much. Um, right. uh, if ever your wife uh, had a baby, had a child, who is not yours biologically. Is that child entitled to the division of, of your interstate? Uh, was that your child? Was, was that your child? Or was that... Is that the child it, was of, not, uh, it was not my child, yes. Okay. We got married and then the wife had a child. Okay, so, so it would be a stepson or a stepdaughter to you? A stepdaughter or a stepson, for real. Yes. So, so there we go back to our tip. Our tip says you can only inherit through blood. So that child is not blood related to you. So they do not qualify in terms of intestate law to an inheritance. The moment you see something breaks there, the moment you see um, the term stepson, stepdaughter, um, 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 uh, stepbrother, stepsister, the moment we see things like that, we know that person is not blood related to you, and then they will not form part of the equation. Thank you. All right. Gloria, um, just add, I just wanted to say, um, I believe the child can only um, benefit if the, the, the stepfather has adopted the child. Correct. If they've legally adopted the child. And of course, also, I mean, if, if uh, 
if um, uh, the, the, the stepfather created a will and, you know, left things to, to the child. But if it's in terms of intestate law, it would have to be adopted, yes. Ladies and gents, we'll, we'll do two more questions before we carry on. Hi, Carl. Hi, Carl. Gina. Okay, I heard Gina. Is there another name I'm hearing? Gloria. Gloria. Yes. I heard those two names. So let's do those two questions. If you missed out now, uh, please, later at a later stage, you'll also have an opportunity. So let's do Gina and Gloria. Hi, Carl. My intestate but then they were married out of community of property but subject to the accrual system okay I i'm glad you bring that up gina so keep in mind ladies and gentlemen we we can take things further if we're married out of community of property with the accrual system that means that everything that you accumulated during the course of your marriage is then split 50 50 so then you'll have to look what the two spouses were worth the day they got married because that will forever be theirs. And then you'll have to look at how much they grew during the course of their marriage, and that must be divided 50-50. So when you see a cruel system as well, then there, there would be a, a, a marital claim before we start with intestate law. But that marital claim will just be based on what assets grew between the parties during the course of their marriage. Did I answer Thank you, Gina? Thank okay, perfect. Gloria? Um, good evening, Kyle. Thank you for the opportunity um, that we can, we are able to ask questions. No problem. Um, I would like to find out if you can just explain again quickly. Under what circumstances can the extended families inherit if the deceased already has a spouse and children? Okay. okay. So as long as long as they are blood related i mean at the end of the day if i am married now and i have two kids with my spouse but i have a kid with another lady and another two kids with another lady those kids with these other ladies are still my blood children and they have the exact same rights as the children of my current marital regime so as long as they are my kids they are of the same standing it doesn't matter whether they're legitimate or illegitimate or whatever the case may be they are on an equal footing with the kids that are born from our marriage. Um, I was actually referring to uncles, brothers, uh, mothers, fathers, like the extended okay. family of the kids. Okay. All right. So, so remember, we're still going to come to that. As it currently stands, if they pose a question that has a spouse or children involved, these uncles, brothers, aunties, and everyone don't form a part of anything. Spouse and children will take everything. Oh, I see. But we'll come to now another part where the other people come in as well. That's still coming. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Ladies and gents, let's let's move on a bit now. Uh, like I said, uh, I again will open the floor up for questions. So that was rule one. Done and dust. Let's look at rule two. Rule two is very easy. It says here, parents inherit next. Mother and father father individually take half so ladies and gentlemen what does it say is if there is no spouse or children the next people in line to inherit is your mother and your father your ascendants in other words now look at the terms i use here yeah. mother and father individually take half so let's say there was a million rand in the state it does not say give um a million rand to your parents it says give 500,000 rand to your mother and 500,000 rand to your father. This is very important when we come to rule three, and it will make sense now. now. Okay. So keep in mind your parents are next in line, but it's not your parents collectively. It's half to your mom, half to your dad. Right. So that's nice and simple. Let's look at rule three because rule three works together with rule two, and then we'll look at some examples I did of this. So let's start off with. Rule three, it says here, collaterals inherit next. Okay, this was coming. We knew it was spouse descendants, next was parents, and then next was your collaterals, your brothers, your sisters, your half-brothers, your half-sisters. So it says here, brothers and sisters and half-brothers and sisters inherit through each parent respectively. That's important, right? In other words, your collaterals, your brothers and sisters, inherit through the mom and inherit through your father. 
right, individually. So in other words, if I had a brother and a sister and there was a million rand in the estate and I said, mother is still alive, my mother's still alive, but my father has passed away. Okay. The million rand rule says give half a mil to your mother and half a mil to your father. So I gave half a mil to my mother because she's still alive. He, my father's half a mil he cannot take because he has passed away. Importantly, if you look at rule two, it doesn't say because father's passed away, the mother must take the whole million. No, 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 no. It says each parent took half individually. So we gave 500,000 rand to the mother. And now we've got to do something with father's 500,000 rand because father does no longer exist. That is where rule three comes in. Collaterals inherit next. They inherit through each parent respectively. In other words, my brother and sister will now inherit through my father. Okay. So that means my brother and sister would take 250,000 rand each. There is a reason why we divide it between your parents. And the reason is because you can only inherit through blood. And a problem arises when you deal with half brothers and half sisters. Okay. Now, let's put it in perspective. If I had two half brothers as well, and they were on my mother's side, they came from my mom's side. If my mom inherited a 500,000 rand, and now I had to divide my father's 500,000 rand, my brother and sister can inherit through my father. But my two half brothers from my mother's side, they are not blood related to my father. So they cannot inherit through my father, meaning they are excluded. My half brothers, your half brothers or half sisters can only inherit through the parent that they are related to. So if I now had to take that same scenario, but I say mother has passed away and father is alive. So father will take the 500,000 rand. Now we must divide mother's 500,000 rand. I have a brother, a sister, and I have two half brothers. My two half brothers are related to my mother. Now they can inherit. But another rule, and I want you to add this to your rule three, half brothers and half sisters count as one person. I'll say it again. Half brothers and half sisters count as one person. So let us put it in perspective. If I had 500,000 rand that my collaterals can inherit, and I have a brother and a sister and two half brothers. That means my brother is one person, my sister is one person, and my two half brothers are one person. So I'll need to take that 500,000 rand and divide it by three. I mean, if I divided that by three, it's something like 166,000 each. The brother would take 166, sister would take 166, and my two half brothers would share in the 166,000, something along the lines of 83,000 each. So I'm just going to repeat the important parts to rule three. Keep in mind, second people to inherit was your parents individually, mother and father. If your parents have passed away, or if one parent has passed away at least, then rule three steps in because collaterals inherit through each parent respectively. Keep in mind, your brothers and sisters can only inherit through the parents they are related to. Obviously, your full brothers and sisters are related to the same parents as you, but your half brothers and half sisters are not related to both your parents, meaning they can only inherit through the one specific parent. The extra rule we added there is half brothers and half sisters count as one person. So let's look at a practical example to make sense of this. If you went to page five, page five. We look at the example, let's go through it together. It says X dies intestate, has an estate value of 1 million rand. X leaves behind the following people. His mother A, his two sisters B and C, his half brother D from his mother's side, and his two brothers E and F. So now we draw this. You see I drew X there, I put a line through X. He leaves behind his mother A. A was drawn. Do you see I still drew father and I put a line through father? Even though father has passed away, you always draw mother and father and just put a line through them to show they are passed away. The reason being is because rule three happens through rule two. 
Then I said, his two sisters, B and C, you'll see B and C is next to X. His half-brother, D, from his mother's side. They are drew D, and I made a line to A, the mother, just to show that D is only related to the mother. These two brothers, E and F, I drew E and F there as well. So all the collaterals are next to me. D is the only one I've made a line to because that's the half-sibling, the half-brother related to A. Okay, and I drew father and put a line through father because we know rule three only exists in rule two. So how will we deal with this? We had a million rand. So straight away, we don't have a, a spouse or kid, so we know it's rule two, it's the parents. We look, A is alive, the mother. So if there's a million rand, it means A is entitled to half. You see, we gave A 500,000 rand. The other 500,000 rand is for the father. But the father is not there. So rule three kicks in. The question now is, who is blood related to the father? If we have a look here, the two sisters, B and C, is related to the father. The half-brother D from the mother's side. That half-brother D is related to the mother, but not to X's father. So we know D falls out of the question. D can only inherit through A, not through the father. But A is still alive, so D plays no part. Then we have two brothers, E and F. They obviously blood related to the father. In other words, B, C, E and F are blood related to the father, not D. So meaning father's inheritance must be shared between B, C, E and F. So in other words, between the four of them. 500,000 rand divided between the four of them gave us 125,000 rand each. Do you see why it's so important, ladies and gents, that we maintain the concept that father and mother inherit half individually. Because if we just said it goes to the parents, then we either could have interpreted it as A took everything or that D can also inherit, which is not the case. The collaterals can only inherit through the parents individually that they are blood related to. Yeah, we had four siblings of the deceased that was blood related to the father that could climb into the father's shoes. D could not because D can only fall into A's shoes because D is blood related to A, not to the father. However, A is still alive. So it means D misses out completely. Okay, look at the example on the next page. Let's try another one. The last page. X dies intestate. Has an estate value of 600,000 Rand. X leaves behind the following people. His sister A. His brother B, his four half sisters from his father's side, C, D, E, and F, and his stepbrother G. Straight away, when I read the term stepbrother G, you know that we're not going to include this person in the family tree. Because stepbrother means no blood relation. So look how we drew it. We drew X, the deceased person. As you can see from all the people that he left behind, mother and father didn't exist. So we know we're on rule three by the collaterals. But you'll see I still drew mother and father there. And I put a line through them. And I took that estate value of 600,000 rand. And I put 300,000 rand by mother and 300,000 rand by father. So I divided it between my two parents. But I put a line through them because they obviously do not form part of this question. They, they, they are no longer alive. A, the sister, is put next to X. The brother B is put next to X. He's four half-sisters from his father's side. C, D, E, and F. Yeah, I drew C, D, E, and F, and I drew a line to the father just to remind me that C, D, E, and F are only blood related to the father. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have 300 by the mother and 300 by the father. So you first start with the one parent, and then you go to the next parent. So let's start with mother's 300K. Who is blood related to the mother? We know A and B are blood related to the mother. C, D, E, and F is only to the father. So A and B share in mother's 300,000 rand. You'll see here we gave them 150,000 rand each. Mother is done. Let's go to the father. Who is blood related to the father? A, B, but C, D, E, and F is also blood related. But keep in mind the rule. C, D, E, and F, what are they? They are half sisters, meaning all four of them only count as one person. So in other words, I must divide father's 300,000 between A, B, that's two people, and C, D, E, and F is the third person. They need to divide it by three. So I gave 100K to A, 100K to B, and then there was 100K to be divided between C, E, D, E, and F, meaning they each got 25,000 rand. 
as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, when the question tells you, the question is going to tell you who the person leaves behind. It might not tell you this person is deceased, but if I tell you that the person leaves behind brothers and sisters and half brothers and half sisters, I'm not telling you that they have parents, meaning the parents are obviously not there. I mentioned nothing about children and a spouse, meaning there is no children and spouse. We can't assume who is dead or alive. We interpret the question specifically. If the question says only your siblings are left behind, it means there's no one else. But in order to properly do rule three, we need to draw rule two. Give half to the parents, draw a line through them. Obviously, they're not going to get it because they, they passed away. And then you let your siblings inherit through each parent respectively. Ladies and gents, this is another important aspect of being. Tepo, go for it. Okay, my question is in relation to um, appearance and abandonment. Say that you still have uh, two parents, and no spouse, no children. You still have um, two parents, but both are still alive, but one abandoned you at death. I mean, at birth, sorry. <laughs> What's going to happen? Is he also going to inherit or is it only going to go to one parent who raised you? Okay. Thank you. So, so, all right. So, so abandon doesn't mean gave or signed away rights towards you as a child, meaning they are still regarded as your biological mother or father. So even if that parent was absent in your life, by interstate law, they are still entitled to their half claim, unfortunately. Thank you. Desiree? Thank you. Desiree first, then Karabu next. All right. Um, so I'm a bit confused with this formula for, for the one that you just did now, uh, huh? with the with the um, with the brother and sister, the um, the half sisters from um his uh, for half sisters from his father's side, C, D, E, and F. I see hmm. A and B received the hundred thousand rand, but I, I, you kind of lost me there on why C, D, E, and F received 25,000 red. I, I think okay. I remember you saying about they being treated as one individual person, hence why it had to be divided amongst the four. But 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 why is that? So 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 that's just the rules, Desiree. The rules is half brothers and half sisters count as one person. So if we have put it in perspective, let's say we cancel D, E, and F, and we say we just had one half sister being C, then I would divide the 300,000 rand between A, B, and C. They would each get a hundred thousand rand, because if you mm -hmm. have one half sister, it's one person. But if you have ten half sisters and brothers, they still count as one person. So a half sister, or half brother, it doesn't matter how many you have; they are one. In other words, the more half sisters and more half uh, brothers, the less money they will mm -hmm. obtain. So C, D, E, and F, they were four, but mm -hmm. because they half, they count as one. So unfortunately, they yeah. had to share in their equal share. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how many they are, as long as they are half brothers, they'll all be counted as one single person. Okay. No, mm -hmm. I get it. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Hi, Kyle. Was next. Hi, Kyle. Yes. Hello. I'm Kyle Bridget here. Ne? I'm Kyle um, Bridget. I just want to ask. Hold on. Bridget, Hello? Bridget, just one second. Uh, Karabu was next, oh, and then you can, after Karabu, it can be Bridget. It's all right. Okay. I get quiet because um, Desiree actually asked the question that I wanted to ask, so that's what. Okay, perfect, Bridget. Thanks. You can go. Okay. Um, I was just a bit confused with the um step brother issue. Um, is the step brother mm -hmm. not regarded as having been adopted? No, no. So remember, if, it's a, if someone's adopted, it will say they adopted. I mean, as a step brother, I mean, it's it's like if my father goes and marries another woman, and this woman has a child, that child has nothing to do with me. I mean, it's it's not my blood. So, uh, you, I mean, the only time you can adopt someone is if you adopt a child. I mean, you wouldn't be able to adopt a brother as such, you know. So unless the question said that that was your adopted brother, then then it's a different scenario. But if it just says step. Then it implies there's no, there's nothing there to it. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Hi. 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 
Um, I just have a question in this scenario. Um, let's say there's there's a guy and he married a woman. Let's say why. So they're married, they're happy, they have two children. He's not happy anymore. He divorces her, but he still has two children with her. Then he goes on to marry another wife. They also have two children and they also get divorced. And then after he goes on and marries another woman and they also have two children. Now he has six children. He dies interstate. Does all of his children inherit the same way as they would as if he was married? Most definitely. Most definitely. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Kyle, it was Raymond. Raymond, listening? Yeah. Uh, something is happening here. Let's say uh, the the, the marriage is dissolved and once it has been there are there are there are, there are children some of the children you brought into the family uh, whom were not part of the wife then when this when you die are these children supposed to inherit even if they were not part of the wife and secondly the the wife receives 50 percent now when they receive 50 percent are they not supposed the wife to receive 50 percent plus the portion of the children. You know, if it is a million rents, they get their 500,000, and then they go into the children's portion. And they also, if children were about two, uh, maybe one, then they also receive 200,000, 250. Thank you. All right, so Raymond, to answer your first question, um, keep in mind, this is, when we deal with intestate law, we, we are dealing with the estate of the dead person, not the estate of the wife that's still alive. So if I pass away now, let's say I have two kids, and uh, I then, I'm not, I'm no longer with the mother of those two kids, but I enter into a marriage with someone else. Now this person I'm married to is not the mother of my two kids. But it doesn't change the fact that they are my two kids so they inherit okay so the question just simply is that you must ask yourself these two kids we speak of are their blood related to the deceased person if the answer is yes then they inherit if the answer is no then they do not inherit and then to cover your second aspect um yes you're quite right the spouse got half that was rule one and then if there was five hundred thousand rand left and it was you and a kid it would be 250 each because and then you would apply the rule the spouses get the greater of 250 or an equal share an equal share was 250 but let's say there was two kids and a spouse if i took 500,000 and divided between the three of them that would give me around 166,000 each that would be a problem because the spouse must get at least 250 so we give the spouse 250 and then what's left divide amongst the kids so never ever give a spouse an equal share that is less than 250,000 Rand, unless there's not enough money in the estate. I hope I answered you, Raymond. I think you did, because um, what was painted all along was that this, the spouse receives his 50% and he doesn't share in whatever that is remaining, because my understanding of this was that after we've removed the 50% from him, he, she is still entitled to a further a child portion. That is correct, Raymond. That is 100% correct. And if you look at the examples, it's done exactly the same way. But keep in mind that is only a 50, you only get 50% if there's a marriage in community of property. If it was out of community of property, then the 50% falls away. Thank you. Thank you. Gloria. 
Gloria? Um, Carl, there's something that I don't understand. Uh, why are the half sisters inheriting if the father is still alive? Because I thought they they will only inherit once the one that they are related to by blood is no longer alive. Uh, are we referring to the last uh, example? Yes. So, so why do you say the father is still alive? The father is not alive in the last example. Father and mother are both not alive. Oh, is it? Yeah, the last example just said X oh, leaves out the following people. Sister, brother, four half-sisters and a stepbrother. So they, oh, they okay. didn't mention. We just drew father and mother and put a line through them. A line means oh, you I passed see. away. The only, yeah, and the only reason why I drew them is to just show you guys how you fulfill rule three. You go through each parent respectively. Oh, I see. So then A and B um, inherit equally from the father also, even though they have already inherited from the mother's side. Correct. They took twice. Eh? They took from the mother and they took from the father. We C, D, E and F just took from the father and they all counted as one person. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. May I Hello, This family here. Proceed. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, with interstate laws, is the estate supposed to be in cash or it can actually be in its property as it was? Thank you. Sorry, I missed that question. Can you just repeat that again with interstate law? Uh, is the estate supposed to be in a, in a cash form or can it be in property as it is? Okay. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a combination of, of, of both. Eh? So your estate is your asset that we can see and touch as well as cash. So when we say, you know, give that person 100,000 and that one 25,000, you know, we might give them um, assets that are valued to that effect. But if we're unable to do so, what they end up needing to do is you'll have to sell those assets and turn it into cash so that we can properly distribute the estate. But initially, it's, you know, it's cash and it's houses, it's cars, it's all those things. We might just need to sell it so we can give everyone their proper cash portion. Hi, Kyle Hilda here. I, Hilda. Just, want, I just want to ask a question about the, the, the half-brothers and half-sisters. And if a parent, like in, 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 in our culture, when, when, when we, we get married, like in customary marriage, and then when there are children outside the marriage, they negotiate those children and then they take those children to the, to the family, negotiated them and agreed that now as a father, I'm, I'm taking these children as mine, I will raise them. So, mm -hmm. but they are not the biological children of the father. So my question is, if the father dies, doesn't that account as an adoption? Customary, it's not registered, it was not registered anywhere, but for me, in my opinion, it seems it's adoption because you've negotiated those children and then you accepted those children as your children. So aren't they supposed to inherit from your father? Yilda, in terms of customary law, I agree with you. So if, if you can show that you follow the customary law, mm. then I would agree that that would count as adoption. But if you're not following customary law, then that wouldn't count as adoption because you never formally adopted the child. But you see, the problem you have is, let's say it was that customary law and you took, um, sort of, you negotiated to take, to take care of this child. All right. So you sort of adopt the child without actually formally legally adopting the child. Now, if that child is to inherit and the other siblings say no, they are not blood related, what will end up happening is a court case. And the court case would be for that child to come and testify that they were sort of given up for adoption at a young age, although the formal papers were not dealt with. And if the court is convinced that, uh, you know, the practice was that, that these, this family gave up this child to that family, and even though no adoption papers were signed, we can clearly see that some form of adoption took place then that person will definitely be able to inherit. I agree with you 100%. But you see the headache there too. If there's a fight, it's going to end up in court. And the problem there too is it's obviously costly. Not everyone has the funds to argue something in the high court. Okay, thanks, Kyle. Hi, Kim Kyle. Hi. Sorry. Go for it. 
Hi. Hi, Kyle. Kyle. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure who's going. Ma'am, you oh, back. I heard one said, sorry, I'm not sure who's going. I heard you first. Yes, hi. Um, I just want to go back to um, half-siblings. Um, I know that you said that half-siblings collectively are one child, but I just want to refer to the notes at page 59, where it says, um, children of half-blood take with one hand, meaning they can only inherit from their deceased parent. Now, wouldn't they be a full-blood child of that deceased parent? They would indeed be a full-blood child of that deceased parent. However, they all still count as one. You know, so it is indeed they take with a half hand because they only take from one specific parent, but they still count as one person. So uh, unfortunately, you know, if you had one half child, then they would take sort of the same way as a full brother and sister would take because they are one. But the moment you have more than one, they still count as one person. So the rules do go on beyond that as well. Okay. Aubrey, uh, Aubrey, I heard your name. Go for it. Uh, thanks a lot, Kyle. Uh, I have a problem here. Uh, let's just say my family doesn't know that I have other children outside of the marriage. <laughs> then, <laughs> let me close the door, Kyle. <laughs> And then uh, I let's say you. I pass on without a will interstate. So, and then uh, the estate has been dissolved. And then after three months, they notice that I haven't been supporting the other children. Then they come and then do they still have a claim? Is there any security finished for when the estate has been dissolved? Whereas they can supply something for them as well. Okay, well, well Aubrey, to start off, your family used to not marry. Now they know. And secondly, the thing is, Aubrey, um, if, if in your scenario that you've put forward, you're saying that no one knew about these other kids, so then the money wasn't divided amongst them. Then they yes. came at a later stage and said, hey, we're also the children, in other words. Am I correct? Yes. I'll get you there. Yes, right. you're correct. Now, now, the question now is, has the money been divided amongst the other children already because keep in mind that when you wind up in a state this is not a process that's going to take you less than six months it's probably going to take you six to 18 months mm -hmm. and you're only entitled to your inheritances upon completion of winding up the estate so if those kids already took money it would be unlawful they would have to pay it back because they took their cut prematurely before the winding up of the estate was completed but let us say for argument's sake, we did complete the winding up of the estate. We gave to your kids from the marriage what they were entitled to. And then afterwards, so I'm saying now probably two years later, two other kids pop up and say, hold on, we were also supposed to inherit. Um, and you left us out. That becomes a very, very tricky situation, Aubrey. And it, it, it sort of matters that even the, 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 the master's office tends to stay away from it. Because technically speaking, we now need to include these children in the ship. Yes. Now, how do I give you, let's say, half a million rand, and then two years later try to claim back that half a million rand? The courts don't want to do that because you could have spent that half a million rand. And the question or answer would be, would you have spent half a million rand if you didn't have half a million rand? And the answer is obviously no. You can't spend money you don't have. So I would not be able to claim that money back from you. It would be an unfortunate case for those other two children. Unless, of course, there is another scenario. Unless, of course, we can show that those kids of yours were fully aware of the other children and they neglected to um, uh, pass that information over to the executor and the master's office. Because then it would sort of be fraud by silence. Then we could have a claim against them. But the way you explained it, those two kids didn't even know about the other kids. So unfortunately, the other kids would 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 uh, ten to one miss out completely. No, I'll, I'll do a win, Kyle. Thanks. Eh? That's the Hi. best way, Aubrey. Hello, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Sorry, it's Marini. Sure, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm not catching names. Mine. It's Zara. Okay, I heard Minor, then I heard Cesara. So let's do Minor first. And, and Joffrey later. 
and Joffrey afterwards. So we'll do three questions. That'll be the last three for this session. Proceed okay. in that order. Hi, Kyle. My question is based on your last um, example. You mm. said if the half siblings, I mean, on X, X has like four half siblings, right? And they're counted as one. So what happens if X's siblings, let's say C and D are from the father and then E and F are from the mother, are they still counted as one? No, 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 that would be then two. Because remember, you inherit through the parents individually. So let's say C and D inherit through the father. So A and B would each take 100 and C and D would share in the remaining portion. E and F would then be carried over to the mother's side. A and B would each take 100 and E and F would share in the other 100. So when we speak of half siblings counting as one, remember it's one through the parents you inherit through, not in total. Oh, okay. No, I understand. Does, does that answer you? Yes. All right. Thank fantastic. you. Thank you. Hi, Kyle. It's Sarah. Yes, go, go for it. Uh, I have two questions. If um, the first question is, if the deceased just has or has two bro half brothers, and they're the only ones who are alive, will they inherit the estate equally? Correct, because there's no full brothers and no full sisters, so they inherit through the only alive or the only parents they blood related to. So they would take everything, yes. Okay, and if um, the only people who are alive are the blood relatives <clears throat> and you have an uncle and he has a son that's your cousin, will the uncle take everything because he's the nearest in degree to you? 100% correct. Okay, cool, thank you. Perfect. And then there was Joffrey, I believe. Hello, Carl, it's Joffrey. Go for it, Geoffrey. I was trying to check this on the road, but I can't exactly find it. A beneficiary dies immediately after the deceased. Can the surviving parent of the beneficiary claim or inherit on behalf of that qualified beneficiary who was supposed to inherit from the deceased, but unfortunately, he died immediately after the deceased? The second question is where there's a trace in terms of relationships. Can a girlfriend so or boyfriend... Let's, let's stop you there, Joffrey, before we do the second part. Let's answer the first question and we'll jump to your second question. So let's think practically about this. You agree that that person who inherited, they died after the deceased died, meaning they were not pre-deceased, correct? Mm. So in such a scenario... The moment I die and I give my, let's say, 300,000 Rand to X, and then X dies, the fact of the matter was X was entitled to the 300,000 Rand already before he or she died. So that 300,000 Rand is going to form part of their estate. And whatever their will says will deal with it or will deal with intestate law according to them. So the fact that they died after me, does not influence my rules or the way I do things because that money will just fall into their estate. So it's no longer my concern. So we'll look at what their will says or what interstate law says about them. Does that make sense, Geoffrey? I'm a bit uh, lost. But you are saying I die now. Let's say I nominate my child X to receive half a million rand. Okay. I die now, and then he the inheritance of 500,000 Rand is due to X, and then X just dies before they can even take the 500,000 Rand. Is that the scenario you're putting forward? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You agree that that money was due to X? Yes. That's it? Yes. Yeah, that was due to X. So now let's think practically about it. That means X's deceased estate has a claim to that 500,000 Rand from me. So even though X is dead, it's still going to fall into X's estate. And the moment it's into X's estate, it's no longer my concern. What's going to happen with X's 500,000 Rand they got from me? Or we'll look at what X's will says. Or if X doesn't have a will, we'll follow interstate law for X. But the fact is it, it falls out of my estate and it doesn't jump from anyone to anyone. Because the rule says only if you renounce or are you predeceased does it say where it must go. But if you died after me, 
the fact of the matter is you did not renounce and you are not predeceased, meaning your estate will take the inheritance and will look at what your will has to say and it will be dealt with like that. But it's two separate matters. Yeah, I'm clear now. Excellent. You had a second question, Joffrey. <clears throat> Can a boyfriend or a girlfriend who has been receiving sort of a maintenance uh, can he or she claim from my estate? Can they claim maintenance from the estate? Suppose uh, they've been receiving uh, a maintenance where there is a trace. Mm -hmm. Can they claim for anything from my estate? Maybe, Joffrey. It would depend on the situation, sir. I mean, if they can validly prove no one's just entitled to a maintenance case. But, you know, some people aren't married, but they live like married spouses. And I help this person, you know, on, uh, and uh, with maintenance on a monthly basis for whatever case may be. That person could come forward and prove that I was maintaining them and perhaps could try and lay some form of maintenance claim against my deceased estate. You know, but that would be a liability to my estate. That would be nothing about spouses. So it could happen, but it's it's a challenge for that person because that person will have to prove their relationship to me and they'll have to prove the maintenance I was paying to them, why I was paying to them. It wasn't just donations, but it was a continuous thing. And maybe they could be successful with some form of maintenance claim. But they wouldn't be um, um, necessarily... Um, successful with a a spousal claim you know that's a whole different scenario um that will have to be looked into but yeah to answer your question in short possibly depending on the circumstances surrounding it yeah uh, on my formal question is there any case law where you can refer me to well not in front of me at the moment hey eh? i don't sit with case law in front of me uh I'm just speaking with you from the top of my head and from the notes that I've, <laughs> I've developed. So I, I don't have case law in front of me, but I'm sure if you go search through your book or um, go look on Safley, you would find something. Thank you, sir. Carl, a All point right. of clarification is not a question. All right, last one. <laughs> Listen, look, um, there's a question that was asked about uh, by the first gentleman who said, you know, look, what happens in cases of uh, abandonment where you find that the father or the mother, one of the parents has abandoned the child. And then you say, look, the law traditionally has been that uh, both parents uh, can inherit from the child equally. But there was a case from 2021. The citation is uh, Wilnash N.O. versus T.M. and others. 2021, uh, Volume 1, All South African Reports, page 600. It was in Houteng by a judge, I think it's the Kolapen, where the father was because the father of the child was disqualified from inheriting because he did not fulfill his duties as a father. The child was raised by his grandmother and uh, the mother. So they were declared as the parents uh, for the purpose, they were declared as parents of the child for public policy and, 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 and so I'm wondering if we were to come across such a question uh, in the exam, how should we, you know, how should we uh, go about it? Should we go with the traditional approach or we should go according to the uh, case law that I've just um, mentioned? Thank All you. Right. Good question, good question. So keep in mind that this is something that was taken through to the High Court where factual surrounding circumstances were put forward and the High Court made a ruling. If you recall, we said yesterday that the High Court is the only authority that can change a certain situation in uh, with regards to wills and estates. So if I told you the father abandoned the child, that means nothing. The father is entitled to inheritance unless it is challenged in the court and the court then reaches an order that says, hold on, I am comfortable with the fact that that person abandoned them. This person took over as the new parent, you know, with formal papers, whatever the case may be, and I can change the law on that basis. But by just saying someone abandoned someone is not a good enough reason to just exclude someone from inheritance. The rule remains father and mother will take the inheritance, no matter what the circumstances, unless it is challenged in the high court and the high court makes a ruling to the contrary. Does that make sense? 
Yes, it does. It does on the definition of a parent, but I uh, I think I get you, but it was just, I think the request was more about the changing of the definition of the word parent, but I fully understand you. 100%. Okay. okay. Ladies and gents, I'll take questions again now. Sipu, you'll be the first one I'll take now. now. But we just got to move on a bit, but keep in mind, you're the first one who can ask the question now, now Sipu. All right. Okay, thanks. It's just... Okay, perfect. There's just two more rules, ladies and gentlemen. I want to go through with you, and then I'll open the floor a final time for questions, because I do think from the questions, we are actually broadening our understanding. We are broadening our understanding and our knowledge on interstate law. Right. So we sorted spouse, children, parents, collaterals, brothers, sisters, half-brothers, half-sisters out in that order but obviously you know there could be a scenario where someone passes away they did not have a surviving spouse they did not have kids their parents have passed away they don't have brothers or sisters or none that are alive to uh, to such an extent the question would be who is next so if you look at rule four it says nearest blood relatives are next so yes we look at uncles and aunties after that, we look at cousins, okay? So we look at nearest blood relatives. Anyone who can come forward and prove that they are blood related to the um, deceased person, they will be next in line. Okay, nearest blood relatives. Now, once that is sorted, there is obviously the possible scenario that there is no blood relatives that come forward to claim. If there is no blood relatives, we move to rule five. Rule five says, if no blood relatives, then a state is placed in a guardian's fund. If no one claims the inheritance after 30 years, then it is forfeited to the state. Advertised in the government gazette. So ladies and gentlemen, if there is no blood relatives that come forward, unfortunately, that person's deceased the state will be placed in what we call a guardian's fund. There it will lay for 30 years. In other words, there is a 30-year opportunity for any blood relatives to come forward and prove that they are indeed blood-related to that deceased person. If they can successfully do it, they will obtain the estate. But the reality is, if no one comes forward in a 30-year period, automatically the estate is then forfeited to the government, to the state. In other words, now that rule five need, need not be a practical question, but could possibly also be a theoretical question. So, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, obviously, you're going to go back and you're going to study your books. But I want you to use all these notes as your basis. Follow these five rules with those tips. And remember, marriage comes first. But follow these five rules the way I've set it out in that particular order. Don't try and digress from it or change things or assume things. Stick to these principles of the way in which people inherit. And we should not have any problems um, should an interstate law question be posed to us. Sipu, I know you had a question. Yes, Kyle. What happens if, in terms of the divorce decree, the spouse is entitled to a spousal maintenance for a period of 12 months. And before that 12 months expires, I passed on. Will that uh, spouse be entitled to, to, to receive the maintenance to my estate? To my estate? Sipu, yes. So what will happen is that spouse will have a maintenance claim against you. Any maintenance claims against a deceased estate is regarded as a liability, a creditor to a deceased estate. So they, for example, if, if you passed away after seven months, they still short five months maintenance. So they will lay a claim against your estate and be entitled to that five months maintenance uh, from your deceased estate. Okay, thank you, I'm answer. Okay. Hi, Adalia. Yeah. Adele, proceed. Hi, can you maybe tell us um, with your first um, example, if the, they were married um, out of community of property, 
What would the, the answer be? Um, how much would the wife inherit? OK, so when you say um, first example, are you referring to page three? The one where they left them with 800,000. Um, I All think right. it was page one, two. Um, yeah, I've got it, got it, yeah. got it, got it. OK, there we had the wife got half because of the marriage in community of property. Yes, so if you, they were married so you, out. Out. OK, yeah. then I wouldn't have worried about marriage then, right? Then I would have went 800,000 rand divided between Y, A, B, and C. If I went 800,000 divided by the four of them, that equals 200,000 rand each. But we know 200,000 rand, that's a problem because that equal share is less than 250. So I would anyways have given Y the 250. Then the remaining 550 I would have divided between A, B, and C. Does that answer you, Adele? Yeah, thanks. So it would have been 183, 3, 3, 3 point something for A, B, and C. That's it. That sounds okay. about right. Thanks. Yes. Cool. And, and if, if my estate value was, let's say, 1.2 million, and if I took 1.2 million divided between Y, A, B, and C, I would have got 300,000 Rand each. That would have been perfect because 300,000 Rand would have been greater than 250. So then I wouldn't have adjusted anything. Thanks. All right. Um, Katlejo. I heard uh, Katlejo. Shirley. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask uh, in regards to whereby I am married out of community with accrual. You said that uh, we share the um, the accrued uh, part of the estate. What happens to that that I came into the marriage with? So that that you came into the marriage with always remains yours. So when you got married, you entered into an antinuptial contract. That antinuptial contract would have stated what you were worth and what your spouse was worth, asset-wise, at the time you entered into the marriage. So that amount is recorded in the antinuptial uh, contract. So when your marriage is terminated, whatever amount you are currently worth, we have to minus what you were worth before the marriage. That's what's left thereafter is to be divided between you and your spouse equally. Okay, but in the scenario of uh, dying interstate, what would happen to that portion that I have left because I've died? Does it go to my spouse or does it go to the children? So, so we'd sort your marriage out first, your accrual system. And I mean, you would agree if you're married with accrual, one of two things is going to happen your deceased estate is either going to owe your surviving spouse money because of the marriage or vice versa. And then when you're done sorting that out, then you go over to interstate law. Okay, thank you so much. Perfect. Kyle? Kyle? Shirley, yeah? Um, okay, now I know I heard Shirley. Uh, thereafter, I heard Sipu. So let's do Shirley and then Sipu. Kyle, in regards to uh, Rule 5, 30 years is a very long time. What I want to know is, is the annual advertising in the government, is it the only way they want to trace or the only means to trace uh, people to inherit? Okay, so Shirley, you, you broke up a bit there, but I think I, I got what you asked. So let me try and answer you. And indeed, 30 years is a long time. And unfortunately, the rules only provide for advertising in the Government Gazette. And I mean, I'm sure none of us, you know, read through a Government Gazette this morning when we woke up and had our coffee. So the reality is that <laughs> most lay people, you know, lay persons out there wouldn't even know about this, you know. So if, there, if you wanted to know if there was a way to trace um, a, a possible deceased estate, you know, the answer is probably not go look in the government gazette because you might struggle. The answer is where did that person actually live? In what area? Then you approach that particular master's office that deals with that area. And then you lodge a request giving details of that person, name, surname, ID number, et cetera, et cetera, and do an inquiry through the master's office 
whether that estate was wound up, yes or no. You know, it takes some time. I mean, I actually did one last year in October, and I'm still waiting for a response from the master's office. So it, it is a difficult and long procedure, but the reality is you don't need to go through the government gazette to find something like that. You would need to then approach the masters, the applicable master's office that has jurisdiction, and they will need to search their archives to see what happened over there for you. Um, sorry, can I just add something? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, there's a website. Uh, you guys can just jot it down. It's ICMS. Is icmsweb.justice.gov.za. Usually, if uh, you have your deceased uh, ID number or names, you can just search and then you'll find out everything that needs to do with the estate. Hi, Hilda here. I, I just want to ask one more question. I got cut when I wanted to ask because of a network. On uh, rule number one, on, on the, the floor. Okay, you're on the floor. On rule number one, on the uh, when the on the eight hundred eight hundred thousand one, I wanted to ask if you are we, we, you get married where uh, there are two spouses in customary in customary and in customary marriage and their marriage were declared. So what happens and the, when and when they are both married, we cannot they cannot marry in community of property, and then the husband dies, and then how is the is they going to be shared because the marriage rule is it's not going to apply. Uh, how do you mean that marriages was declared both in community like, yeah, property? Yeah, like, not not in community. They were married in customary. You married the first wife and second wife, and then you go and declare the marriage at the whole affairs, which means the other marriage has to be. It can never if it's two marriages, it can never be in community of property. If you marry a second wife, it will never be in community of property. Um, am I right? Yes. So 100 percent correct, ma'am. And then what will happen when you a, a husband die? How is the estate going to be shared? So so why don't you declare it home affairs? Mm. What they request is you set out a plan in terms of what you leave behind for your second spouse. Right. So that's the correct way to actually go about doing it. So you would have your first marriage in community property, and that spouse is obviously entitled to half of your estate. But then you have a recording that's noted down at the home affairs where you leave specific things for your second spouse or specific amount of money, you know. But when you haven't done that, it would effectively mean you died in test state and then would have to fall back on the rules as we looked at now. now. And then the second one will share as a child, the second wife will, will the, 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 the second wife will, be, will have a share of a child as well. Correct, correct. Same exact rules as applied to wife one. All right, okay. Thanks, Kyle. Perfect. Sipu, I know you will wanted to ask a question. Yes, Kyle. On the very same example of the 800,000, and if the marriage is out of community of property, will the spouse continue to, to receive the other 250,000 rent? Yes, they would, Sipu, because the, the rules of interstate law are totally separate from marriage. So it doesn't matter how they were married. Uh, the reality is you would still follow the exact same rules um, of interstate law. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Nikita. Okay, I heard, uh, I think it was Nikita or something along those lines. It was Nikita. Carl, hi, thanks for taking my question. I'd just like to find out, with regards, it's got nothing to do with the information today, but with regards to the case law of the subject in terms of the exam do we have to take notes of each and every case would we have to reference it do you have any idea what we would have to do in terms of the cases so nikita let me try and answer that question in twofold um firstly i obviously have no idea what's going to come forward in your exam and they obviously will not grant me access there too Anyways, as I, I can't present a lecture when I know what's in the exam already. Um, secondly, Nikita, I can tell you from past experience, I can only speak. I haven't really seen much reference at all to uh, questionnaires on case law. 
I mean, it's more, it, the questions is more based on, you know, seeing if you understand the word, not asking you to quote cases. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't see the, the relevance of asking you to quote a case law for me because in real life, all you do is you look it up. No one knows case law by heart necessarily. So I, I don't think that would come forward. But on the same breath, I can't guarantee anything as, as I don't have access to the exam. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, super right. again. Sipu? Yes, uh, Kyle, is the interstate law a compliant with the, the values and, and the Bill of Rights of our Constitution, especially on the question of equal before the law, treating all people equal before the eyes of the law, especially in relation to you have brothers and sisters or step brothers or step sisters. Doesn't that so, um, doesn't that so, repudiate the 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 purport of the Bill of Rights? Well, well Sipu, you know the Bill of Rights of Constitution is a funny old thing. That same Bill of Rights gave you the right to housing, yet people are evicted from their homes on a daily basis. So I wouldn't get too carried away from, you know, what the Bill of Rights say, because uh, what they try to do is, they, is they, they create different aspects of law, which they feel doesn't necessarily interfere with any aspect of the Constitution. If you have an issue with it, you know, you can always challenge it, as people have done in the past. But that means they would have to change the law as a whole. But yeah, from my past experience, I wouldn't be too hard up on the Bill of Rights, because there are many things that that constitution says you're entitled to, that, that doesn't quite happen in reality. Okay, thanks. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, we seem to be all right for now. So I think the key thing is, uh, you know, I hope these notes do assist you, and maybe some of you didn't quite follow some things now, and are too shy to ask whatever the case may be. The reality is you have these notes, work through it. I mean, you could probably self-study these notes anyways, uh, um, but they are summarized. I have summarized it to the extent that I feel is most relevant and that is going to assist you moving forward when it comes to interstate law. Okay. Keep, in, keep in mind it is a practical um, question. So, you know, you will be neat. You will need to be prepared in it. I mean, it could easily be asked um, to you for 10 or 15% of the value of your exam. And that's 10 or 15% that we don't want to throw, uh, throw away at the end of the day. All right. Okay. Ladies and gents, as far as interstate law goes, uh, just a reminder to make sure you mute it. Thanks. All right, so that's wills, that's test state law, that's in test state law. And I just want to remind all of you that, you know, if we wanted to, we can probably take questions for a couple hours, you know, but that's not the, the exact purpose. And we do try to accommodate everyone. We do try to take as much questions as I can. And I give you the opportunity to ask questions on a number of occasions. But at certain stages, I do need to cap it because we do need to move forward with things. And the reason why I've kept it as well is because I want to start a bit with estates. You know, I want to speak about the um, the uh, the steps we take in winding up a deceased estate. And the reasons I, I want to speak about it tonight is because tomorrow night and Thursday night, I want to um, purely focus on the Allen D account. Ladies and gentlemen, the steps for winding up a deceased estate is going to take us half an hour, but I do think a 10-minute break is in order. It is now 20 past 7. Let us return at half past 7, and we speak about the steps of winding up a deceased estate. Thanks. When are we coming back? At half past seven. Half past seven. Thank you. Thank you.